when I'm watching the news, I need to remind myself of that. <laughs> it's great if you can say that this morning, isn't it? I have a certificate here this morning, a membership certificate. This certifies that Misty Willett has been received into membership of the Banner Church of the Nazarene. Misty, would you come and receive that at this time? Congratulations. And is Baby Jordan, is Baby Jordan's not here today, is he? I've got a dedication certificate for Baby Jordan. All right. Well, I'm still in resurrection mode today. I think I will dismiss the children at this time. I hope that the resurrection is still affecting you some 2,000 years later. I hope that you're living in the realization that resurrection life lives inside of you as a believer. I hope it affects every aspect of your life, the way that you deal with issues from a, on a daily basis. I hope you're ex experiencing that resurrection life. I'm sorry that our sins put Jesus through such an ordeal, but I'm so glad that he was willing. He could have called 10,000 angels, as the song says, to destroy the world and set him free, but he died alone for you and me. Well, I told you this story about the little fellow. When in our class, we were doing an Easter project, and he just raised his hand and he said, why do we call it Good Friday if that's the day that Jesus was killed? That's a pretty good question, don't you think? Maybe you've wondered the same thing. I remember wondering that when I was a child. Why in the world do we call it such a terrible day, Good Friday? And as we've already discussed through this Easter time, he was arrested on that previous evening, taken to an illegal trial where he was mistreated, beaten, and humiliated. On Friday morning, he was taken to Pilate where he was beaten again. A crown of thorns was pressed on his head. He was given the robe of a king and mocked and humiliated even more. They placed the cross on his back for him to carry to the place of execution. They stripped him of his clothing, laid him on a cross, drove nails in his hands and feet, and he hung on that cross bearing our sins, our guilt and shame, paying the price for us. And yet we call it Good Friday. How is that? Well, maybe it has something to do with those words that he cried out, in a loud voice, it is finished. What was the it that he was talking about? What is finished? What did Jesus accomplish on that cross? Well, I like words. I guess you could call me a word nerd. I don't know, but in English, in college, English 101, I like the book, Word Power Made Easy. I, it, I guess this is true confession time. I like words because words help me to understand complex ideas. To me, words are, to a writer or to a speaker, like brushes and pencils are to an artist. They help, they're a wonderful means of expression. So I'm going to talk about four words today that you don't normally hear in everyday conversation. First one is found in 1 John 4.10. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That version says, the NIV says, atoning sacrifice. Propitiation. That is not a word that you hear every day. When Jesus cried, it is finished, propitiation for our sins was accomplished. Well, what does that word mean? It means atoning sacrifice. Webster says it means to make favorably inclined, appease. The synonym would be reconciliation, satisfaction, or atonement. We were placed on God's good side. We were on His bad side. 
But propitiation satisfies the wrath of God. God was the offended. We are the offender. Propitiation has to do with the offended person, which was God. When Jesus said it is finished, the price for our sin was paid in full. Our sin was atoned for. God's holiness was satisfied. His wrath was satisfied. His justice was satisfied. That's why I asked the praise team to sing the song covered by the blood this morning. When our sins are under the blood, they are removed and remembered against us no more. We stand justified before God as if our sin had never happened. Think about it. What would you give for a fresh start? A clean slate. Total exoneration. When Jesus said it is finished, that was the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sin. God was appeased. Once in sin's darkest night, I was wandering alone. A stranger to mercy I stood, but the Savior came nigh. When he heard my faint cry, and he put my sins under the blood. From the burden I carried, now I'm set free, for Jesus has lifted my load. Oh, the love and the grace I received in its place when he put my sins under the blood. I can ne'er understand why he sought even me, why his lifeblood on Calvary flowed, but sufficient for me, since he died on the tree, he hath put my sins under the blood. They're covered by the blood, covered by the blood. My sins are all covered by the blood. Mine iniquities so vast have been blotted out at last. My sins are all covered by the blood. That's an up-tempo song, and sometimes I think we miss the theology of it. I think it's good to slow it down every now and then and think what we are saying. The blood of Jesus satisfies God. Has that ever dawned on you? It, it hit me in a heavy way when I was reading The Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee, and I realized that the blood of Jesus is good enough. I was so inspired by that thought that I wrote a little tune about it. It's a pretty amateur little tune, but it, it, a tune nonetheless. It's good enough. God is satisfied. I can't add anything to the blood of Jesus Christ. It's good enough. All the works, all the theology, all the religion, all the good deeds that I can possibly do in this life, I cannot add anything to the blood of Jesus. We can't work hard enough to pay for our sins, we can't add anything to the blood because it completely and totally satisfies God. Now, I'm not saying that good works aren't important. James said, faith without works is dead. Good works are important. We were saved to do good works. God has good works planned for each and every one of us, but they are not the means of our salvation. They are the result of our salvation. They are the evidence of our salvation. Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. So pardon is freely extended to each and every individual. But if you remember the story of George Wilson, remember old George that refused his pardon? The Supreme Court ruled that it's only a pardon if it's accepted. George was hanged. It, a pardon is extended to each and every one of us, but we must accept it by faith. Sin destroyed the relationship that man enjoyed with God and brought the curse of sin on mankind. We all know the story of Adam and Eve in the garden and how they were created sinless and and how they walked in the cool of the evening with God, and they had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Him, and, a, and then sin destroyed it all. If you've never repented of your sins and accepted God's free pardon, then God's wrath and judgment are still on you. 
Think about that for a minute. That's why Jesus had to die. 1 John 3, 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the power of sin. He died for the whole world so that the penalty of sin could be paid. It was love that drove him to the cross. 1 John 2, 2, he himself is the, and there's that word again, propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the whole world. Now, you may have think that you've messed up so bad that God can never forgive you. That you've just sinned too bad. You've just been so, no, you're mistaken. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. We're all part of the world. That whosoever, whosoever means me, whosoever means you. Which reminds me of another song, I'm happy today and the sun shines bright. The clouds have been rolled away for the Savior said, whosoever will may come with him to stay. All my hopes have been raised, his name be praised, his glory has filled my soul. I've been lifted up and from sin set free, his blood has made me whole. Oh, what wonderful love, what grace divine that Jesus should die for me. I was lost in sin for the world I pined, but now I am set free. Why? Because whosoever surely meaneth me. But until you repent, you still live under the curse of sin. You're still on the devil's side, and you will be an object of God's wrath. Come to Him and be forgiven before it's too late. Take advantage of the propitiation for your sin that was accomplished when Jesus said it is finished. Well, not only that, road, word number two is redeem. Redemption. Redemption from our sin was made available. To redeem is to repurchase, to buy back, to free from captivity by the payment of a ransom. Now, you, you don't hear the word redeem a lot. Some people say, I wish I could redeem myself. I watched a baseball game yesterday at Joe Becker Stadium, and there's some guys that are probably wishing they could redeem themselves today. My mom used to use the word redeem a lot because she collected S&H green stamps. <laughs> we need to go to town. I've got three books full, and look what I can buy with these three books. Let's go redeem these stamps. So I heard it at home. What's the word mean? To repurchase, to buy back, to free from captivity. The best example that I can think of right offhand in the Bible of redemption is the story of Hosea and Gomer. Maybe you're familiar. Hosea chapter 1 the Lord told Hosea, and Hosea was an upright, righteous man. He said, go take an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness. Take them in, and being the obedient man that he was, he married Gomer, an adulterous woman. And she did what Gomer often did, she was unfaithful. And in chapter 3, if you want to go ahead in chapter 3, the Lord said, go show your love to your wife again. Though she is an adulteress, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. So Hosea went again. He bought her off of the auction block. She was a slave. He bought her back. He took her home. In verse 3, he said, you're to live with me and I will live with you. Now, it was a strange command for God to say to a righteous man, go marry an adulterous woman. She was unfaithful to him, and God said, go buy her back and restore her to full rights and privileges as your wife. Of course, we probably have already, you're ahead of me on that one. Hosea represents God, and we represent Gomer. You see, we belong to God by virtue of creation. Everything belongs to Him. But we were unfaithful to Him. 
We ran around on him and flirted with sin. And Jesus, just like Hosea, went to the cross and redeemed us, bought us back, and restored us to sonship, joint heirs with Christ, full rights and privileges as sons and daughters of God. Let that sink in for just a minute. When you think of the word redeem, John 8, 34 says, everyone who commits sin is the slave to sin. If you're not a born-again believer in Jesus, whether you know it or not, you're a slave to sin. You're a prisoner of Satan. He controls you more than you realize. The good news is, according to Luke 4.18, Jesus came to proclaim release to the captives, to set free those who are oppressed. We can be set free. On that Friday, according to Hebrews 9, verse 11, Christ appeared as a high priest, not through the blood of goats and calves. Jesus didn't have to offer any sacrifices for himself because he was holy. But through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He entered the holy place as high priest, offered his own blood on the mercy seat, and purchased our eternal redemption. That's what he did. When he said, it is finished, our redemption was made available to each and every one of us. So what should our response be? Should we be unfaithful to him, like Gomer? Should we go out a second or a third or a fourth time? That wouldn't be appropriate. The appropriate response, according to Colossians 1.13, we are rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And our response is, 1 Corinthians 6.19, we are not our own. Verse 20, we are bought with a price, so we honor God with our body. Considering everything that he has done for us, he held nothing back. He gave his own blood for us to redeem us from sin. Our response would be to say, I'm not my own Lord any longer. You are the Lord of my life. You're the boss. You're in charge. Take me, use me in any way you see fit because I want to honor you with my life. That would be the appropriate response. Thirdly, Reconciliation with God was made possible. Reconciliation. We've got propitiation, redemption, now reconciliation. That is to resolve a dispute between two parties and restore that relationship to one of harmony and friendship. We can now have a relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. Aren't you glad your relationship with God was not irreconcilable? That's the reason that people give for divorce today. Irreconcilable differences, incapable of being restored back to a relationship of harmony and friendship. Too, go too far gone. Our relationship with God is not too far gone. It is reconcilable. Jesus paid the price for our sins, satisfied the wrath of God, that's propitiation. He redeemed us from the curse of sin. That's redemption. And the outcome is that we can now be reconciled. We can now be restored back. Colossians 1.19, it was the Father's good pleasure through Him, Jesus, to reconcile all things, even nature, back to Himself. Having made peace through the blood of the cross, and although you were formerly alienated, that's past tense, Hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now, present tense, reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless beyond reproach. So when Jesus said, it is finished, that was a mouthful. So now what? 2 Corinthians 5.18 All this is from God 
who reconciled us to himself through Christ, now he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He has given us the ministry of building bridges between holy God and sinful man. He's given us that ministry. He was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. That's what we're here for, to spread that good news. He's given us the mission of sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we might see lost people saved and reconciled, restored back to where they were originally created to be in relationship with their Creator. So on that Friday, nearly 2,000 years ago, propitiation for our sin was accomplished. God is satisfied. Jesus' blood is good enough. Redemption was made available. We're no longer slaves to sin. Reconciliation with God was made possible. Our relationship can be restored which brings about the greatest gift ever available, salvation. Salvation. The deliverance from sin and the consequences of sin. Death, separation, eternal damnation. The cross is a picture of our theme for this entire Easter season. Say it with me, John 3.16, King James Version. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, is there any doubt why we call it Good Friday? No wonder we call it Good Friday. Stand with me if you would, please. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I wonder if there's anyone here today that would like to take advantage of that wonderful gift that's all wrapped up in that word we call salvation, propitiation, redemption, reconciliation. You want to be put back right. You want to be saved. You want to enjoy eternity in heaven would there be someone who would raise their hand and say yes that's me all right I'm going to assume then that everyone here today is a Christian and that is something to praise God about if you do have some doubts you're reluctant to raise your hand today just let me remind you First of all, to admit you're a sinner. Secondly, believe that Jesus is that Savior that you so desperately need. Put your faith and trust in Him. And then confess. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you so much. There we go again. That word just seems so inadequate for everything that you accomplished when you said it is finished and what it means to us each and every day of our lives today. We just thank you. We just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to respond appropriately. We realize, Lord, that you've given us a job to do to spread the ministry of reconciliation. We pray that you'd give us the strength and the courage and the inter- determination to be faithful in that mission. We thank you, Lord, for these that are here. We pray that you would bless them. pray, Lord, that you would bless the food that we're about to eat. We pray that you'd bless our fellowship together. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the mission trip to Costa Rica. We give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.